Yo, Promly. Let's pause for a moment and unwrap episode six, Scar Tissue. And believe me, just like the name suggests, this one is all about wounds, both on your face and in your feels. On one hand, you got Tabitha and Jim who finally decided it's time to address the issues that they've been pushing aside because, you know, running for your life doesn't leave much room for couples therapy. Their marriage has been festering because they've been too busy fearing for their lives to address it. And this episode gives us a front row seat to all of that explosive argument. Scar tissue isn't just emotional scars, though. Randall's face? Yeah, it looks like Deadpool and Wolverine held a barbecue on his face and forgot to invite sunscreen. Meanwhile, Jade's over there making breakthroughs on the mystery front. Or at least he thinks he is. He's got the bottle trees on his mind, but my guy also needs to confront his real enemy. The bottle. Dude's battling alcoholism while playing detective, and let's just say things are getting, uh complicated he needs to put a stop to his alcoholism before something permanent happens and grows into his metaphorical scar tissue but before we dive in look you know the drill if you're vibing with these breakdowns hit the like button drop a comment and please smash that subscribe button please everyone please give this video a like a comment and more importantly please subscribe we hit 12,000 subscribers and yo i am beyond grateful but let's get to 30,000 by the end of the season because I've got something really big planned for you you're sharing your time with me and I truly appreciate that I'm gonna make sure I respect that please subscribe because I'm trying to do something really special for us I need your help to make it happen let's do it anyway this episode kicks off with Tabitha staring out the window like she's questioning every decision that led her to this nightmare town. And Jip, he decides to play emotional roulette. He's out here, oblivious as ever, suggesting she just come back to bed, like they're living in suburbia instead of horrorland. He tries to come for her, but let's be real, Tabitha's about two seconds away from hitting him with a boy bot. Pro tip for the fellas out there. Ask your partner what they need. Do they want comfort or do they want solutions? Jim clearly didn't get the memo because playing emotional roulette and offering comfort with Tabitha wanted answers, eh, that was a rookie move. She swats him away and then things escalate into a classic TV couple's argument, screaming included. Jim even drops the old, I'm not a mind reader line, which let's be honest, is never a winner. Tabitha claps back, mocking him for being mad about babysitting his own kids. And even the monster started screeching like, yo, can y'all keep it down up there? Look, I know this moment was supposed to be funny, but I was crying, y'all. <laughs> we then switch to the next morning with Tabitha acting like the walls ain't paper thin, but Julie is not in the mood to pretend. Jim went to the settlement to get away from his, I mean, to go get food. He went to go get food. And Tabitha offers to make Julie some edible food. Julie starts letting her mom know that this is why she's got that rebellious attitude. She says some slick shit and then just walks off. We then switch to Jade and Boyd going over Jade's findings from the bottle tree. And yes, oh my gosh, yes. Thank you, Jade. Thank you, Boyd. Sharing information is great. Do this more. Jade starts running through Reddit level theories like it's a meta joke at some of those far out theories that some people, I ain't gonna point no fingers, but some people, you know, the numbers on the bottles are a code. It's a quantum event. Maybe it's a wormhole. Maybe if we put in the right numbers, we'll end up at the right place. Look, Jade's deep diving through some of your Reddit theories like he's got a PhD in Frumley fan conspiracy. I ain't pointing fingers. But some people really are buying what some of these randoms are selling. If you see this scene and don't recognize that they're talking about those creators and Redditors and Discorders, then I can't help you out. Look, the most I can do is help those of you in our Monday Night Movies crew to navigate through the noise and head toward the actual answers together. Okay? Look, I'm done with my mini rant. Boyd finally cut through the nonsense as well, reminding us that there's more than one bottle tree. More than one! And yes, 
Finally, characters in this show start sharing information backward and forward. They exchange it. Let's do this. The writers must have heard us screaming at the TV all throughout season two. You know that something big is about to go down when you hear this music. Boyd drops a major clue, 1864. Jade's now ready to take a closer look at the second tree and we're finally getting somewhere, folks. Over at Colony House, Victor is acting, uh, Victor-ish. Henry's found the box car in his room with Victor claiming it came from a Mrs. Davis and she got it for her ill son. Creepy enough, when he casually says that Mrs. Davis is gone and her son is probably gone too, like we, we all know something is up with this dude. He, he's, he does this. Victor's ready to go on a quest. But Henry's not letting them wander off alone like some horror movie cliche. No, they head toward the tunnels together, leaving us wonder what they're really about to uncover. We then switch to Kenny and Marielle in the clinic, with the show once again proving that they've been listening to y'all funny little comments about this show. Not only do we get a moment with Kenny and Marielle not having any beef with each other, like some of y'all been saying, but Marielle ain't bothered by Kenny at all. It's almost as if she doesn't even see him there, let alone see him as a threat between her and Christy. And look at that. Look at that. Marielle's got the keys to the medicine cabinet. She's officially trading in her drug addiction for some good old medicinal trust. This is progress, people. This is what it looks like. Anyway, we switch to the front of the clinic with Boyd catching up with Kenny. Boyd notices that something ain't right and Kenny tries to play it off like everything's okay. Boyd then heads inside to check in on Randall and see how he's doing. And my guy Randall is suffering. Like, he doesn't have the benefit of pain meds like you would get in a normal hospital. You just see him sleeping through it and struggling throughout the night. Christy runs into Boyd and is miraculously back on her feet like a day after getting her foot caught in a bear trap. Wow. Christy mentions how the ambulance that came into town has an ultrasound machine and mentions that Fatima should come by to check on her little nugget. Speaking of Fatima, we switch to Colony House where Ellis is looking like he's Googling divorce lawyers at from town. He didn't sign up for eating garbage, but before he throws in his towel, he tells Fatima that they need to go see Dr. Christie. Fatima though, she's in full on denial, not wanting to face the facts, but then Boyd shows up giving some emotional support. We then see that Ellis also knows how to play emotional roulette and lands on comfort, which this time actually works at way better than it did for Jim. But remember fellas, ask. We then switch to Donna, who's out visiting the new Dale art installation. Tabitha rolls up and Donna quickly shifts gears. They talk for a bit and Donna reveals that Dale was a pain in her ass for like two years. Uh, they talk more about poor stupid Dale, with Donna still looking like she's mourning her lost lover. Tabitha talks about how she's been having a pity party for royally failing at using her opportunity in the real world to get any sort of help from the people outside to help rescue these people. She tells Tabitha that She's trying to be a hero, and it only ends up one way, in a wall. Literally in Dale's case. Donna has no interest in trying to figure out what's going on, and she encourages Tabitha to not try to be a hero either. I'm starting to think Donna's fresh out of hope points. She shut Jim down about the voice on the radio back in season two, and now Tabitha's getting some of the sage advice as well. Come on, Donna. We then switch to Victor and Henry heading toward the tunnels with Victor preparing to go inside to go grab Jasper. I don't know what happened to his plan to go in there with Sarah, but here we are. Henry lets Victor know that ain't no way in hell he's letting Victor go in there alone, with Victor just giving in that Henry's going to go with him. Victor whips out some 1980-something vintage army men like he's prepping for the G.I. Joe reboot. Who knew breadcrumb navigation could remind me of my childhood? We then switch back to Boyd, Ellis, and Fatima with Ellis and Fatima sitting in front of that painting that we often talk about on the wall. It feels like this was put in the shot on purpose because the last time I saw this painting, I could swear they still had this space set up for a bed for Julie, but some of y'all still not ready to talk about that. Boyd and Ellis are going over how Fatima has been eating trash. Ellis is looking for some comfort from his dad and Boyd doesn't have a good poker face. Nope, Boyd is over here looking like he caught his son skinny dipping with dogs. 
just confusing and disgust all mixed together. He blurts out that Christy has an ultrasound and throws it out there so that they can take a closer look at the demon baby. Fatima, once again, doesn't want to get answers and wants to head back to denial. Ellis puts his foot down and Fatima seems to give in. We then switch to Randall and Marielle in the clinic with Marielle ready to change Randall's bandages. Randall's back to his usual cheerful self and gives Marielle some attitude for her hospitality. We get a little bit more from Gore just to scratch that itch for all you Gore porn junkies and shows us all of Randall's horrific scars. He's definitely not winning any future beauty pageants and even pulls a Jack Nicholson Joker moment when he says he wants to shake his face. He looks at it, he gets to see just how jacked up he actually looks and it's all Boyd's fault, of course. Nah, just playing, but not really. We then switch to Kenny going through his kitchen looking for where his stuff is when he catches Julie outside fake smoking weed. Kenny asks about a screwdriver that used to be in the drawer and has a moment when it starts to sink in that his house isn't his house anymore before heading inside and then looking at the shrines of both of his parents. And I ain't gonna lie, seeing Tian Shen's shrine, damn, I get it. This house ain't home no more. We then switch back to the tunnels with Victor reaching that same chamber that had the wall painting where Jade saw the Nkui kids, so this chamber, right? But it's now completely empty. Victor realizes that they need to go deeper and refuses to leave without Jasper and they start going deeper in the tunnels. We then switch to Ellis and Boyd trying to wrap their heads around a person eating garbage. Boyd being the understanding dad knows that this is one of those cries for comfort. We then switch to Elgin inside Colony House playing with his new Polaroid camera and taking pictures. He like rudely sneaks a picture of Fatima talking about how he's going to put together a Colony House photo album but it's, it's, he's just terrible at reading them. Fatima then heads outside all wrapped up in shame and agrees to let Boyd and Ellis take her to go see Christy. We then switch to Jade who seems to find the other bottle tree that Miranda set up and realizes they're high up in a tree. When out of nowhere he gets another visit from the ghost of Tom. They talk for a bit about whether or not the bottles in the tree mean something with Tom highlighting how Redditors are grasping at straws trying to put together clues with Jade defending some of y'all and I can already imagine y'all in these comments ready to tell me that y'all don't think that this is meta commentary. Go ahead. Get it out your system. Tom then gives Jade some shit for being a weak drunk who is a shadow of his former self and before Jade can give him a smart ass response Tom pulls a Batman and does an Irish exit. We then switch to Ethan and Tabitha reading through one of Tian Chen's books. They talk a bit about Tian Chen with Ethan wondering if Tian Chen and Bing Kian were happy when they got married. But Tabitha peeps game that Ethan heard their argument last night too. Ethan talks about how he was happier when everyone was too scared to argue. They then talk about what Jade is doing and for a moment Tabitha mentions that Jade is trying to figure out a puzzle and for the life of me the way that this little dude just lights up the room in this moment when he says, what kind of puzzle? He almost seems like his old self. And I almost thought for a second that someone was really going to talk to Ethan about all of this and get some answers. But instead, Tabitha hears a noise upstairs and has to go investigate. Now, we have a cool little moment when Tabitha heads up and sees the return of the Garbage Pail Kids. And man, even the Garbage Pail Kids are going through a growth spurt. Holy crap, there's three of them too. And they scare the hell out of Tabitha with only Ethan there to scare them off with his main character energy and save his mother. Ethan calmly and wisely asks, was it the children? Yes. Want to go outside? Mm-hmm. I mean, this little mofo is developing such leadership energy. I'm curious to see how this all plays out. We then switch back to Donna who is stacking a pile of rocks in front of Dale so he's not a visual reminder of how hopeless the folks are in town. I love that she did this because Donna is still doing things to preserve hope and the other folks even though she's running out of hope herself. Kenny comes by and asks Donna if it's okay for him to move into Colony House now that the Matthews have taken over his kitchen. Donna agrees to let him stay with Kenny even asking if they still have those wild sex parties anymore. She didn't say no. We then switch back to Jade who's working on the bottle tree mystery with 
Ethan and Tabitha coming by to help. Jade's over here playing genius or crazy, and honestly, I'm betting he's one hair away from talking to dead Tom and furniture again. What surprises me is how agreeable Jade is in the moment to let Ethan in on this puzzle, which is a big change from the Jade we met in season one. Jade mentions that the numbers in both bottle trees are exactly the same, but the interesting thing is that the numbers in bottle tree number two were written in cursive, as if they were written by two different people. Hmm. Now, real quick, I think that these notes in the bottle tree are actually notes or methods of communication from one chromonocle to another, which is what I call Tabitha and Miranda. I feel like these are some sort of code that they leave each other from generation to generation in order to help their next person in line to pick up where their predecessor left off. We then switch back to Marielle and Randall with Marielle giving Randall some medicine and she's ready to discharge him. Randall wants to know why Marielle ain't acting like things ain't crazy and Marielle tries to brush it off. But Randall asks what if the madness of the cicada creature isn't over? And wait a minute. Am I the only person getting some weird energy from Randall and Marielle? Marielle even offers to let Randall move into the clinic with her and Christy and says that she'll talk to Christy on Randall's behalf, and he surprisingly agrees. We then switch back to Henry and Victor in the tunnels, and it looks like they are deep in the tunnels. Henry is shooketh, and Victor is surprisingly the brave one when they finally come across another chamber. This one has all the stuff that the monsters have been collecting, including Jasper. They have Jasper sitting up at a table made with a teacup and plates like they play in house. And my goosebumps are, uh, are these toys? They be down there playing like little kids? Victor grabs Jasper and prepares to head back when Henry sees some fabric or cloth that looks familiar. But the problem is that he made one peep too many with one of the monsters waking up and threatening Victor that if he keeps coming down here, then one of these days they're going to make him stay. And Victor and Henry run for their effing lives. But what does this mean? What if he keeps coming down? What do they mean? Like, make him stay? Are they going to turn him into one of them? Are they threatening to use him like a toy? Are they going to trap him like an Nkui kid? What, what do they mean? We then switch back to Julie, who is noticing that Randall is finally moving out of the bus. And surprisingly, Randall is not nearly as big of a dick to Julie as he is to everyone else. Julie mentions how getting stoned has helped her with the voices in her head, and Randall is all like, yo, like that ish. We then switch to Henry and Victor in the back of Victor's Peaches truck with Henry trying to wrap his head around what the hell just happened. They get settled for a bit with Henry learning that this was Victor's hiding spot when he was alone as a child. And man, I'm starting to think I was wrong about Henry because he has not given me abusive dad energy at all. Victor talks about how they'll be able to get information out of Jasper. Henry's in disbelief. Victor is adamant. They're going to get this mother flood pucket doll to talk. We then switch to Christy, Fatima, Ellis, Boyd, and Marielle, ready to do the ultrasound, and they start looking inside Fatima to try to find the little peanut. And it doesn't take long for Christy to have that look of worry on her face when she tells us the most shocking news of the season. She's not pregnant. Fatima is in denial and asks her to check again, but look, there's nothing there, and Fatima starts freaking the F out. Ellis is like, okay, then we need to tell him about the garbage heat. We then switch to Elgin, who's developing the photo of Fatima that he stole. When we see him look at it, we see that dang zombie kimono lady standing right behind Fatima. Damn it! Damn it, damn it. Now we're gonna have a hundred more theory videos flooding YouTube about Fatima being the kimono lady. God dang it. Just when you thought this stuff was starting to end, it's back like a clingy X. The zombie lady even appears to Elgin out of nowhere with a proposition. She tells Elgin how she can save everyone and help them all go back home. And just when things were getting freaking good, convenient ass Clara comes walking by and scares away the kimono lady. And I'm starting to understand why some of y'all think Clara's a little sus, right? This is a little weird. We then switch back to Ethan and Jade going through the numbers in the bottle tree with Ethan noticing that the number two is written backwards on some of the notes. Jade then talks to Tabitha and tries to console her that the Nkui kids aren't trying to hurt Tabitha. 
She then sees a drawing of the Scarecrows from the settlement with Tabitha all of a sudden having flashbacks. And she remembers the three red stones that were outside the settlement. She's never been there. But she does talk about how she remembers this place from her nightmares as a child. And holy crap, Tabitha had visions of this place when she was a little girl. Before she even got here. Just like Miranda. Now, before some of y'all get started, I already did the legwork. I got a picture of young Tabitha and a picture of young Eloise. Here, here they are, side by side. They don't look exactly the same. And wow, this was a really cool episode. So much has happened. Victor and Henry went on their tunnel exploration. Boyd starting to pull the threads together. Tabitha and Jim, well, they're holding it together by a thread. Episode six actually gave us a lot, but you know, with this show, it always leaves us wanting more. The writers are listening, y'all. This episode is proof. They had a town meeting last episode, and they showed everyone why that was a dumb idea. It's like they heard the show wasn't scary anymore, and then they amped up the danger. And they definitely heard when we were saying that we wanted to see the residents talk to each other all throughout season two, because these mofos are out here talking, talking. Okay, David, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm, I'm really excited to speak with you today. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, um, we're going to have fun. I'm going to ask you some questions that might be a little hard, but I'm, I'm going to try to keep it as light as possible. Sure. So, Jade, right? Fans have really, really connected with Jade, whether it's because of his sarcasm, his intelligence, or his vulnerability. He definitely just stands out from the rest of the characters. Did you draw inspiration from any real life figures, any famous fictional characters, or maybe just your own personal experiences to help bring him to life? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm, I wish I could say that I was that creative. I'm absolutely not. I, a lot of it has to do with the script. The writing is, it, it's, it's all on the page. Also, there was, there were things about certain people in my life that when I read the script and like, oh, this reminds me of this and that, and just, it, it kind of came together. It felt seamless. And after a while, I just felt very aligned with the character and it felt intuitive. And it happened a lot faster than it does with a lot of other characters. So there's something there. Yeah. Hmm. Next question. Um, if you had to predict Jade's role in the end game of From. Do you think he'll be the one, and this is your own personal opinion, do you think he'll be the one to crack the mystery or could his obsession ultimately lead to his downfall? Yeah, that's really interesting. Could it be hubris? Um, well, there's really two questions there. Like, what is the end game of the show? I have no idea. And what is Jade's ultimate participation in that? I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's very likely that his enthusiasm for solving problems gets him into trouble. Um, but uh, also, uh, Anthony, how much have you seen? How much of season three have you watched? I've gotten as far as episode seven. I'm kind of pacing oh, myself. Well, um, it's, uh, it, the show takes a very interesting turn towards the end of the season. And that's not spoiling anything. That's just a fact. Um, it, how does, how does Jade, how could Jade possibly, oof, um, I think the stakes are a lot higher for Jade going into season four, if God willing, the audience and the studio give us a season four. And, um, I think in terms of his intensity, I don't think we've seen the last of Jade. I think that things happen that make him even more committed to solving the puzzle and to an eventually, like eventually succeeding to get out of there. I hope that's my, that's my, that's my sort of, that's my suspicion, but again, uncorroborated. <laughs> the writers don't tell me anything. I'm the last to find that. Okay. 
Well, Jade's interactions, let's talk a little bit more about with other characters, particularly with Boyd and Tabitha, right? Mm -hmm. These interactions, they're often tense, but they're, they're layered with complexity. Can you talk about how Jade's relationships have evolved over the course of the season and what working with actors like Harold and Catalina is like? Oh, it's a dream. I mean, it's a dream to work with actors like Harold and Catalina, but also like everybody in the cast. This is this cast. This is an ensemble cast. It's the closest I felt to um, working on stage, doing theater that I felt in front of a camera in the 20 plus years that I've been doing this. These are very talented actors and beautiful people. Like they're just so nice and everybody gets along. I feel like I'm being pranked. You know what I mean? Like it, it doesn't make sense. Everybody's so great. Um, I do finally have a couple scenes with Harold this season. Um, and we counted like not since season one where he, we were at the flower and rock ceremony in episode three, where, you know, we have like a big interaction. Um, but it is good. It's it's great to see more people interacting with more people this season, whereas previously, and I and I and I wonder if this was as a consequence of writing uh, in a way that would protect us from COVID by like basically siloing characters, mm -hmm. so that certain characters only work with certain characters, so that if anything went wrong, we could isolate and we could like figure that out. And you know, like I worked a lot with uh, Scott Cord previously. And then this season, Jade starts to interact with more people. That was kind of cool. Um, the the story arc with Tabitha, obviously, it starts to uh, it springboards and it starts to flourish as as um, as as a wedge, you know, is driven between her between Tabitha and Jim. It feels as though to me that she instinctively, you know, with Ethan in tow comes to Jade sort of say hey look we have similar cause here like we need to get out of here and it seems like you're the only person actively doing anything about that as opposed to just maintaining the status quo or the peace or just trying to get along with the monsters like you need to get out of here I need to get out of here I've been out of here I need to get out of here again let's work together and figure this out I think that's really interesting um and Jade obviously also has like these one-off moments with characters like Bakta, um, you know, Tom the bartender, like all these characters where we see a different side of him. We don't see the showman. We see the, you know, focused on you, you know, how do I relate to you? He's underneath it all. There are so many layers. Like you said, he is all of these things. And I love playing him for that reason because he's not just one note on a keyboard. He's like, he's multiple chords. And if you listen, you can hear notes over here, notes over there. And it all, it, it all becomes this one human. So it's, yeah, it's been so much fun to play. And also, again, you got to give credit where it's due. It's like the writers have really been patient and crafted this story over a long period of time, like three seasons, 30 episodes. So Jade gets to be this and that and this and that. And at the end of it, we see who he is, um, which is hard to do when you've got like, you know, 90 minutes to tell the story in a movie or you know, two hours, like 30 hours is a different ball game. Well, thank you so very much. You gave me such beautiful answers. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for the rest of the season, hopefully a season four. Um, but thank you so much for your time, David. Thank you, Anthony. I appreciate it. Have thank a great day. You too. Look, if you're still out here trying to figure out what's scarier, these monsters or your ex's Instagram page, do me a favor. Hit that like button, subscribe. So this way I got your back, right? I need you to like, comment and subscribe if you're loving these breakdowns. Let's hit 30,000 subscribers before the season ends, because trust me, you won't want to miss what I have planned. Anyway, that's all I have for this one. I'm going to see you all on Monday with the Monday Night Movies crew. And we're going to do this again a little bit later. Peace.